how mad whiteness is about our joy, about us being cute in these restaurants together, about us winning, about us headlining a Super Bowl. Like that is evidence of the power, how free we will always be. Hi, hello, and welcome to According to Ease, the podcast, where we're going to have candid conversation with the hopes of finding a way forward in community. See, we exist and experience life at the intersection of our complex identities and our socio-cultural and political systems. And let's be real, the only way to dismantle it all is to start by dissecting it. So get cozy, get comfy, and let's dive in. Hello, 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 and welcome to an episode. I never remember what episode I'm on. An episode, the only episode you need to worry about right now, of According to Ease of the Podcast. I am very excited about my guest today. I know I'm always excited and y'all are probably like, you're always so excited. That's because I get really lucky to have really dope conversations with really fucking phenomenal people. And today, I, you know, a lot of, in this past season and last season has been a lot of like people I was already in community with. And so I have to, I have to admit publicly, I'm like fangirling a little bit because there are some people you like kind of see on the internet or somebody introduces you, you to them, shout out to Presh, who's on, on Team Wheeze, was like, how do you not know that this human exists? Like, they're in Oakland, you're big tripping. And I was like, wait, what? Who? Oh my God, how do I not know that this human exists? And I am very honored that they are here today. So doctor, because you can't forget the doctor. Never. You got to add the doctor. <laughs> doctor, <laughs> Lenny Savory is here with us today. And y'all know how I, how I swag it out. I'm going to kick it over to you to tell the people within the context of this conversation, like who you are and what you do, because they can read the fancy schmancy, you know, professional stuff uh, on the interweb so that we can spend our time talking. So first, thank you so much for being here. I am like really, really amped. Thanks for tell. having me. I'm also very excited to be here. I've been seeing you on social media and Precious has been talking about you forever. So I've been following you and um, listening to how you read these folks down <laughs> so much. So I'm really happy that we can in first space today. Virtually. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So who are you? What do you do? What do you want the people to know before we dive in? Absolutely. So I'll um, tell you all again, you certainly visit my faculty profile uh, at UVA Psychology or UVA Women's Studies. I'm the one of very few Black folks. You'll see who I am if you go there. But essentially, I'm a assistant professor of psychology and women, gender and sexuality studies at the University of Virginia. And my work takes up questions about um, Black women's freedom, Black women's like gendered racial socialization, and how it is that we come to have attitudes and beliefs about selfhood, about identity, and about intimate partnership that have us messed up in the game mm -hmm. <laughs> in all the ways, jeopardizing our health, our well-being, and particularly I'm interested in sexual health. So I have some papers that just came out that if you want to know more about them, feel free to ask. But I'm really kind of- Look at the links in the bio. Y'all will get the links to the things. Yes. How do we get seduced by these notions of beauty and these notions of like piety or respectability and imagining that's where the most resourceful sort of like abundance and pleasure and safety is going to come from? And how do these- racist narratives about what you shouldn't be actually mm -hmm. betray our possibility by internalizing those things. So I'm a psychologist who thinks about community, who thinks about Black ecologies and pop culture. Uh, my dissertation used Trina's uh, baddest bitch <laughs> as a framework of like, y'all are saying that we need to be these kinds of strategies. And also like, let me show you how all respectability is going to catch you up. And it is mostly in being subversive and being collectively oriented that we might find these elements of freedom and pleasure. So I just want to study that and just like read psychology down. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get into like all of the dopeness that you are doing now, because I don't even know how to like, you can't like quantify it. I think what you are doing academically in the world just by honestly existing in your selfhood and modeling that for you know other femmes and women of color and specifically black women and women and femmes is just so profound but before we get there i'm gonna ask the question that i know everyone's like how sway like how did you get to a point where you're like not only is this what i need to study this is what i am committing myself to 
and everybody else needs to get with it? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's no simple answer for mm-hmm. that, except for <laughs> divine, divinity, cosmic sort of relationships that I really feel ancestrally held on. In like, I've been faced constantly with the realities. I've always been a community activist around health. Mm-hmm. I think my first job was working at a homeless shelter and I was like, getting all of the black and Latinx folks on my caseload and everything that the women and femmes had to negotiate was in and around this like patriarchal power that was trying to delegate what their sexualities might be able to do in pursuit of this freedom. So while we had a lot of immigration stories um, and a lot of folks who were negotiating around like safety at, at in state. Um, both for folks who were formerly incarcerated or sort of under surveillance by the law when it came to Black people, and then for folks who didn't have citizenship, how they were also playing these games. When it came to women and femmes, their bodies were implicated. Like, Mm -hmm. it was the number one chip or capital that they sort of had to work with and barter. And in that way, it was also like, well, who owns it and how do I use it? And certainly, how might it be a channel for my own freedom outside of these exploitative or transactional relationships to nation and state. And that nation and state was imbibed in the like interrelationships that they sort of had. They were in their intimate partnerships and their relationships with their kids and their relationships with their parents. So I think I came through imagining I was really going to be on this emancipation journey and really be like focused on um, anti-criminal, you know, justice sort of issues thinking about criminal justice reform, like working with people who are really doing abolitionist work. Mm -hmm. But I found this really interesting nexus around the ways that state surveillance manifests itself on femme health. Um, That so many of the women who I had in my caseloads and early in my career had to go to jail to get screening prevention, to get medication, to get HIV tests, to get any, to get treated for STIs and STDs. Like, they had to go to jail sometimes to stay away from domestic violence. Like mm-hmm. it was all kinds of like relationships that are so nuanced in terms of what does the state do to enact violence on our bodies in these explicit ways. And also like, while you're there trying to get treated from this STI, you might get um, non-consensually sterilized. And so like, I think I stayed and in, in sort of grew a very intrigued relationship by thinking about where can emancipation live for reproductive justice of Black women and femmes, and how do we negotiate? How do the infrastructures of power actually even shape our relationships that we're choosing in our own personal world? Like that same injustice that we are experiencing in the world, like becomes an erotic injustice that sometimes we're the architects of in our intimate partnerships. Yeah. And it was like, there were so many questions there. <laughs> I wanted to ask them forever and figure out a way out and be kind of a cartographer mm. of freedom in yeah. and around uh, erotic injustice. Yeah. So you said something and you said it really quickly. So I want to make sure that people didn't miss it. It's this idea of bodily autonomy, right? And sexual autonomy. And the ability to use the body as capital to freedom and to emancipation. That's really, really fucking important. Like, that's not something that I want people to just be like, oh, no, that like kind of sounds cool. If you like elaborate on like, what does that mean both conceptually and as a practice? What can that look like? That is literally like anthologies and like papers and dissertations and books, right? I think a lot of people have admired in that question. When it comes to Black women and femmes, it's not like subjective. It is actually like tangible because our bodies were chattel that reproduced the labor force that was the culprit, was the foundation of capitalism that we're currently in the Game of Thrones in and about. And we're like, we. So like Black women and femmes had a very specific role in how we created white supremacist, heteropatriarchal capitalist like infrastructures. So to take yourself out 
of that system where you then are utilizing your own body to be able to wield some of that commercial. It is highly contested and you'll always see the most extreme levels of law and surveillance in and around how you should never be able to utilize your body in ways that are about your own freedom because it is accounted for. They have started, they've, in all of these ways, I think I have a lot of colleagues who work in thinking about schools and thinking about how many prisons they're going to build based on the reproductive rates of poor black people and how they're performing in second grade. Mm -hmm. They have these like corporate enterprises that are investing in the amount of prisons that they're going to build private even in 10 years and 15 years banking on this labor bank. It's in the, in that way, the like the system has not shifted in terms of how it is going to get its ends met. But what they're never banking on is like how, all of us and black women are like outpacing every other demographic in terms of like utilizing academic achievement as one part and more entrepreneurial basis and more power. There's more small business owners in black women's communities, especially even during the pandemic than other demographics. And we haven't figured out what is that going to mean? Like, what does it mean when you're enfranchised in such a way that you're flipping the state of Georgia, you know, like in yes. like you have more degrees, more credentials, more money, more power yep. in yourself to make a times up to influence white ladies to take it up in order to be able to do it. But like, what's new on that front? Mm -hmm. We didn't have a, a structure to really think through that. Black women have always been the like architects of freedom for everyone. Right. Like literally the underground room, <laughs> like literally a spy. Right. I I will be having whatever cognitive or whatever issues, but I will be like the most masterful, like navigator of land to freedom. So useful that the government has to use me to actually be like an enterprise for them. It's yeah. like, irrefutable how masterful black women are at navigating this like system. Mm -hmm. But I think so often and the thing I want to take up and that I'm most interested in is why is it that Black women are so quick to utilize all of that in the service of folks who are not going to do that on their part? So we are Ooh. giving it to everyone. We're giving it to Black men. We're giving it to family systems. We're giving it to structures, to spiritual systems and, and infrastructures and empires who just never have Black women's wellness at the top of their list. Yeah. So what would it mean to take all of that Black lady magic and say like, First and foremost, only us. From this day forward, only us. Right. That's what we're doing for the next 50 years. Like, what would that look like? And if we're focusing on bodily recovery, not hiding, not dissemblance or subversion or quieting or silencing or like, a, like becoming opaque entities so that nobody can sexually exploit us. But what if everyone just tried a million stallion approach. <laughs> what if we all just said, like, guess what we're going to do? Kill it. Let me tell you, I just had some a conversation with literally an hour ago about how Megan the Stallion should be the new archetype and is becoming because she has so skillfully embodied, first of all, baby got her degree. While <laughs> while being the hottest selling, bangingest body, all the things, all got her degree, right? So that's the academic piece. First black rapper, period, let alone black female rapper on the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Magazine, right? Like has a deal with Nike and said also, y'all love all this body. Like she mm. has taken her sexuality and to your point, she's like, oh, well, I'm not going to let y'all use it. I'm going to enterprise my my own literal body and look at me winning and look and, at me being amazing. And, you know. There's a cost for that. A hundred percent. I was just going to ask you, so what's the other side of the coin? Not, right. From someone who enacted violence and harm on your body for whatever reasons that we will never say because your primary priority is to protect black men because that is a black woman's role mm -hmm. is racial uplift and protecting every single person 
Now this fool went out and made a, some kind of disc record and was talking all kinds of trash. Yeah. When you're literally infirm in the hospital body and you still didn't say anything. Right. Because whatever that code or that mandate or that expectation of uplift everyone to the detriment and death uh, of yourself, yeah. that's over. Yeah. That's, I would, if I can in, like interject, I think black women are freaking everything. Yeah. The one thing that I hope to be able to untangle is just that. I do. I do want to to dive into this because that is the one thing that like people were like, yeah, is she a real one for, you know, that's the conversation that was online. She's a real one for that. And this, that, the other. And I was like, is she though? Like, yeah. she's a real one because to your point, like that is the existing archetype, right? Like, oh, if you're really a writer, if you're really, if you're a real one, like. You know, you don't snitch, you, you know, you uplift at all costs, even if the cost is your own life. But in reality, if we're talking about true emancipation and liberation, then the expectation should be, how about you don't shoot black women? Yeah. Or how about all the people who are out here talking about how real she is doesn't go support the album that comes out from the person? Like, yeah, that that one I'll never understand. Like y'all can understand our, why our ca- canceling our Kelly is okay and makes sense. But like there, that, there are people who are out here still like, well, thankfully I don't know those people. Well, I'm, I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm like, thankfully I don't know those people. Cause I haven't seen that. You know what though? Maybe it's just will, willful, like not seeing. Um, Cause the people I follow on the internet are all in agreement, but I will say even those people are like, Oh yeah, but I still listen to, Oh boy. I'm sorry. What? Yeah, did Spotify or Apple drop nope. that music? Exactly. And why didn't it? Because people are still listening. Yeah. People exactly. are still listening. It's exactly. Still yeah. I mean, it's easy to to cancel an R. Kelly when the streams have gone down. So you yeah. can like quote unquote easy, because you can say, Oh, I'm gonna do the righteous thing. It didn't really make a difference. Like you weren't gonna make money off that person anyways, because the community has spoken. But the community has said, Meg the Stallion getting shot, mm, she all right. Um, it's that it was, and she's all right. Right, so, she's okay. She didn't look. She didn't even tell us what happened. You know exactly. And also, so I think being in formation with black women and femmes is a nuanced and an arduous scenario that has long ranging consequences. I think I was just talking to my team this week about like how do we make sense of the fact that like her collaborated with Chris Brown. Like, how could you do that? Like, her is, like, she's supposed to be, right? Like, then what does it mean? And then one of my students was like, well, Rihanna did too. She, like, did that cake remix with him. So, like, she, in doing that, made it okay. that's right. She was fine. And it was like, and this is why it is always so nuanced. You'll never be able to untangle. Now, for Black masculinity, it gets to be divorced from its reliance or its, like, a commitment to like the excavation of emancipation on anybody's front. It gets to be its own entity. Yeah. But like, women and femmes will never be extracted from how do they like both be exploited by and, and sort of like eroded by these enterprises, but also what did they do for it? Yeah. What are they what? Doing for it as a demonstration of their even worth or value? That's always like under question. Yeah. What do you attribute that social reality to? And again, I know I'm asking you these very these questions that you're like, girl, I could write a whole new dissertation on this. But like just to get people to start thinking and seeing like it was born of somewhere. It always is. Where was that born of? Mm. And that might be too big of a question for you to answer right now. And that's fine. No, I think I think it's. (laughs) I think it's a great and important question. Yeah. And I would say that of all of the like historical renderings about how we came to this, like what this one author whose name is escaping me right now, she's actually calling it like a toxic black femininity. Like we talk about toxic masculinity as imagining that something, yeah. but like toxic femininity is the fact that they will like work in the service of others to the detriment of themselves. Mm-hmm. So like toxic masculinity is about what it's enacting, the detriment that it enacts on other people. Toxic femininity is the detriment that you're enacting on yourself in for this expectation that you have to advance the wellness of everybody around you, even if those people also don't mean you well. Like triple triple jeopardy in that case. 
And, and in that framing, which is so prolific and beautiful, we don't know how, how we get there. It, unless it's just a vestige of misogynoir. That's yeah. so like intimately tied to like every single, like thinking about the 16, 1619 project, like you can probably trace misogynoir's construction and maintenance and re remix addition yeah. in like, every single pillar of economy and polity that we have in society. Yeah. So I study the media. I study like contemporary media and how through yeah. music, how through uh, entertainment, how through magazines, how through imagery do we get, arrive again at new young women's like embracing of these controlling images and these gender racial stereotypes as truth. Yeah. As, and I think like, even when you don't believe them to be true, the fact that you know other people think that they're true about you means that you have to navigate them in ways that sometimes end up looking like you internalize them or endorse them your own self. So I think um, I'll probably spend the rest of my life trying to think through not just where did they come from, mm -hmm. but how did they persist and how are they constantly having so much cultural and social salience, even when we have like Simone Biles and freaking Serena Williams and freaking Michelle Obama and over, like we have 30 to 40 years of like almighty enterprise domination of black femininity. Yeah. And these vestiges of black women's oppression are still so salient. And yeah. the young girls today are still somehow getting these notions that like, this is their role, but this is what they're expected to do. Yeah. So on that note, I want to kind of like, we're going to stay in the same vein, but we're going to take a left, right? So you mentioned your two articles, which there will be links to. There's the one that pretty hurts is the one that I want to tap on real quick, because mm -hmm. um, as a sociologist, you know, we look at media as one of the institutions and pillars that upholds, right? It's one of the eyes of oppression is institution. So it's exactly to your point. It's how we take the ideologies. You know, I know you know this most likely. I'm going to assume because you're fucking brilliant. But just for the listeners, you know, it's how do we take these ideologies? And in this, in our very real world, it's how do we take all of the, I call them the isms, racism, transphobia, you know, all of the isms, Islamophobia, whatever ism you want to think of, it's there. It is an ideology born out of white, cis, het, patriarchy and mm -hmm. supremacy. And then we have these institutions and the media. Ooh, the media is powerful because think about it, right? From the day that you, that your little cute baby brain can start to interpret and understand imagery, it's seeing everything from ads to cinema to music to music videos or hearing music rather, music videos. Like you're constantly getting messaging. Mm -hmm. And the media uh, in... I mean, there's a lot of institutions, but the media, as far as I'm concerned, is actually the number one pillar of not only how we continue to ensure that these ideologies persist in the ways in which they exist, but also how, how do we control people and how do we control narratives and how do we, going back to our conversation of choice, how do we make people feel like they don't have choice? How does oppression continue to win? Right? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways, you know, from again, from a like behavioral scientist, sociological perspective that we see is essentially if you can convince a people to internalize that messaging on their own, then you've already won. You don't even need to be present to oppress them because they will guarantee the existence of that oppression, right? The spirit of it, that it continues to live on. Mm -hmm. And so pretty hurts. And again, everybody should read these. Um, really gets into to beauty standards, right? Mm -hmm. Especially, and we always I always call it the white is right, like mm -hmm. just across the board, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's virtue, you know, physicality, like whatever the thing is. So that was my very long introduction to basically kick it to you and say, mm -hmm. talk to us about that. Talk to us about the ways in which, specifically through media, mm -hmm. we are getting not only the images of and quote unquote standards of beauty from body to and phenotype and all of that. And I'm going to ask, cause I think your brain is already going to go there. Let's, let's put black fishing to the side just for a second. Cause I'm mm -hmm. going to want to talk about that double standard, but, but let's talk about that. Let's get into that. How, 
how this imagery, not only it continues to perpetuate oppression Mm -hmm. and then we internalize it and and do it to ourselves, but also how it gets in the way of our selfhood. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was really, I love that it's called Pretty Hurts. Like I've been thinking about it since Pretty Hurts came out. That's when I started thinking about the study because I remember seeing the video and I was like, so she's writing the Beyonce, the Beyonce. There's trap of my dreams is writing this everybody's song. dreams. Okay. Like fake crying about how hard it is to be pretty and how like none of us should buy in as she's standing in front of her trophy case of the beauty, like awards, like, and being the pillar by which all black femininity is measured according to like yeah. knowingly and unabashedly knowing like, is Holly and me and who's to say who's winning at this moment? I would say fiscally I'm winning at this point and um, the lack of divorces and presumptions of my crazy and the fact that nobody has seen my body and I didn't have to show my whole body with some nasty white man in order to get an Oscar. Okay. I won it all. Um, I think like she would argue I'm a feminist, you know, quote unquote. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I'm winning, it's clear. And also, like, you don't have to be pretty. We should divest from notions of pretty in order to be, like, free was the claim. And I said, bitch, you're the one, though. Like, and so, uh, and even in your, like, narrative about it, no one is confused that you do not care supremely about being the one. That you do not frequently show yourself and make sure that your accounts continue to remind everybody that you're the one specifically in all of the ways like in between I'm the music one, but I'm the movie one. I'm the, I'm the Coachella one. I'm the, I'm the Ivy park one. I'm literally whatever I'm doing. Just trust I'm the one I'm the Disney one now, girl. Mm -hmm. I'm Afro beats now. I am her. Like she is me. Like, I'm a poet now, girl. I be taking these little spoken word people and not showing their faces. Uh huh. Be ghost people. I could have put them up here. You will but not. But I'm not going to. <laughs> I will use Messy Maya or Big Frida. You will not see their faces. You will see me because I am them also. Like I think there's this commitment to being the one, right? Mm-hmm. As we're talking about, like, no, it's me and Kelly and Michelle. Like it's us. It's Mama. Is it? It's like, it's my sister. I'm like, sure, it's all of those things. And it's also you, girl. But like, okay, so what does it mean to, 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 to really, meanwhile, all the science, right, on, on health says like Black women are objectively understood to be the least attractive folks. Like on all the dating platforms, Black women get the fewest likes, uh, like, Black women are hired less, disproportionately paid, you know, like just judged more harshly on every barometer in terms of physical attractiveness. And the paradox of that is that black women feel finer than everybody, like at every size. It's interesting to like listen to the white scientists like reporting on that finding. And then they do this pathological model, like strangely, they're fatter than everyone and think they can pull harder than everyone. Like, Wild, but so we don't need to study them. We need to study the frail white girls who are anorexic at 11, you know, because those are the folks who like need to be saved. These plus size queens who feel like they can pull your husbands, probably because they are pulling your husband, girl. I was just going to say, people don't feel like they can unless they are. Like, There's this notion that they're just beyond reproach. Like they have this inflated sense of self-confidence that's not really based in reality. And so Mm -hmm. they're as a psychological study or an endeavor, we should just focus on redeeming and savable sort of folks. They kept saying black women are, have the largest BMIs, but the highest self-esteem and that's some shit that's for them to do, to work out. Like, we're not going to do that. And I was like, no, no, let's ask them. Let's ask, let's do that. Let's figure out why. Let's figure out why. And and like let me understand like let me get to the the method of the madness about how it is that you can't just say they're exempt from poor self esteem mm-hmm. in relation to white supremacist beauty and physical standards because they're actually harmed at school from children they're harmed at every doctor's appointments it is weaponized their lack of appearance standards are weaponized in ways that create 
early death rates for black women, like in all of the ways. They're the ways that they have to like negotiate into intimate partner relationships where violence is supposed to be there. And there's this like notion that we have to accept that because we're already lesser than. And like Andre 3000 says, top notch hoes get the most, not the lesser, right? right? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you're considered to be the lesser, then in some way someone's imagining you have no right of choice. And as we talked about earlier, I'm like, we always choose them. And in matter of fact, we deserve to be the choosiest ones, right? Like someone walk over and say, choose a lover. So I just think like the reason why it's in the room is not because we put it in there. Mm-hmm. We have demonstrated that we understand our internal value and worth. And it isn't even about how worthy we are to me. It isn't about how worthy we are to partners or to white supremacy. It's because we have bad ass bitch homies that big us up on the regular. We have, we have yes polka dots. Like we have yes. Like, okay, we, Amanda Seals, yes. <laughs> for our girls, for our yeah. crew. And our crew sees us. And we think that our crew is better than every single person out here. And if our homegirl says we got it, you can't tell me nothing because we literally are every single one of the thing. Right. And so I think in my framework, I'm like, oh, how do we like utilize that collective positioning and that inter like that intergender, intra gendered, intra racialized and gendered and culturally gendered space of power? How do we make that the barometer for how we use selfhood and the challenges, even if it is a resource spot, <clears throat> even if it can lead to like individual difference metrics where we feel better about ourselves, the fact that all of the negotiation is structural, the fact that like intimate desire moves through a script that has been tainted by this oppressive infrastructure means that you are constantly interfacing with something that we call meta stereotype awareness which is just the mere mention or the mere notion that somebody else thinks these debasing things about you becomes part of your cognitive load Mm -hmm. in ways that do diminish the power of feeling fucking like good as hell as lizzo would say in yourself and in your homie like your squad that has minimal utility on what you can actually do because racism is so insistent yeah yeah, and as- the story that I'm writing now is <laughs> informally <laughs> pretty hurts dykes too because somebody else was like, oh, like what if, what if like you're non-binary or what if like you're queer in theory if you're not trying to conform to these like notions of patriarchal beauty? Like we know that girls are getting off the most with you know the the folks and and queer people should feel more empowered. We should have again the stereo the the like the mythology is and it's based, it's data driven that queer women do feel more expansive in terms of what presentation can look like and and are more celebratory of different kinds of ways of being desired but like girl we are still having to navigate very similar infrastructures and those vestiges do come in to our intimate partnerships too so we didn't see invariance like we call it measurement invariance to see whether or not those scales like held up and queer women uh and non-binary women were still holding themselves according to those standards and judging themselves accordingly too well yeah i mean there's the reality of you can't escape female socialization no and all of that is born out of c cis het white patriarchal supremacy like you can't escape it i love i I just (laughs) just as an aside because you're you're from here, so you get it. I, the other day, had posted, because, like, you know, my hair was down and my curls were banging. And just some random girl, I don't even know homegirl. Just, like, I'm driving. And I pulled up to the stoplight. And she's like, okay, sis with the curls. And you couldn't tell me shit for the rest of the day, You're first of all. Can I tell no. you today? Right. Like, no, you, that's it. You told shit today. <laughs> that's it. Like, I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And I, like. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The sun got brighter. I turned my music up and I posted on IG and it all, literally all it said was, if you are not of or in a community of black and brown women and femmes that do shit like that, where strangers, one, hit you with the sis and then two, just let you know you look fabulous, like you will never truly understand the gas up. Like, you just won't. Yeah. You won't. And and so I just, I love that, that the cultural reality of that mm-hmm. is 
now in science. Like, that's it. That was my whole spiel. Like, I just, I love seeing more and more. And this is also why I'm like such a fan of, well, I'm just a fan of black and brown women and femmes everywhere. But like, especially who are being really, really mindful and intentional of bringing cultural realities into the science and into academia. Because even that is like that. It's like, to me, it's like, it's still the little like, fuck you. This is how liberated I am. Like, I know that you want me to like use all this cute science and I'm going to, but also these things are real. You yeah. might not be measure, be They're able to. Because we're dying. I, I was just going to say. Proportions, like the stakes are so high. Exactly. Like, your point about like the power of the media, like part of why I fuck with the media as a framework for thinking about what is empowering here is because you've had 20, 30 almost 40 years of like critical feminist and hip hop scholarship. That's like, girl, that's where our narrative lives for how bad we are. We're literally like, this is where our love letters to how like everything we are, are happening. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well then if you live in the like neighborhood of where the folks are bigging you up, then you must be psychologically the most resilient to the fuck shit. Yeah. And it isn't so because it couches itself in your neighborhood. You can't even apply for an apartment. Like the way that you get paid at your job for people who have to go to the hospital, like going to the post office, all of your sort of like social treatment and everything that you have access into the world, like in some ways is tainted by, again, these like rules. Um, I do yeah. think there's a way to learn and glean, but I think one of my studies that we did in 2017 was about like, oh, so everybody says social media is like going to fuck up your mental health. Well, but what about black girls who are only like, yes, black girl magic and going all hard on all the blogs and all the things that are specifically like promotive of like black brilliance. Then we found that like for those avid users, they had the most detrimental health of them all because like it still lives in the place where you are now just an over consumer of the very narratives. And because so much of our narrative about how we got to beauty was at the expense of like, Yes, girl, they tried to say, but like you, like, and it's in a hyper awareness every single time that we're exceptional, like, not just in spite of, but like, because of, because of. Yeah. I, and I think I like Beyonce is constantly talking about like stepping on albino alligators, like all of these haters, like I'm, I'm amazing in spite of you. Like I couldn't even see you, Becky. Like I can't because you can, but I think that is a reminder again, of meta stereotype awareness, that yeah. even in our empowerment, we are still being reminded of how we are subjugated as a, yeah. as a humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think that like gluts or minimizes the utility of us utilizing that as our space of freedom. Yeah. I think for me, I think of like the gas up in the same, in the way that I think of laughter for mm -hmm. oppressed folks where it's like, we have a lot of reasons to not find joy and to lament and to have no hope. But we have found ways to continue to, to thrive and be joyful and connect to our humanity. Right. And so I think to your point, to me, I look at it as like a, it's a survival tool, right? When you have the whole world consistently telling you, sending you those messages through the media to your point, like, in your apartment hunt, in your job hunt, in the, when you walk into the bank, in every single interaction that you have okay. sometimes the thing that you need is is you know the gas up or is the moment of laughter to keep from crying because otherwise you're constantly aware even if you don't think you're aware of the ways in which you are oppressed which is why i said like for me i was like it doesn't even matter what happens today this, I, I don't even know you. I might never see you again. Exactly. But you did what needed to be done. But you did it, girl. Thank you. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take uh, a little bit of a dive into the health aspect of mm -hmm. all of this. So not only, you know, and, and I'll say this. I think right now what, what I'm seeing a lot on the Internet is, and rightfully so, right, we're having a lot of conversation around like black maternal health. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm super important. But and also, there's a lot of other ways when it comes to health, mental, physical, sexual, right? Um, just general overall well-being, stress levels mm -hmm. that we need to look at. Because to your point earlier, 
every single one of those, you know, let's call them health categories, if you will. Black women and femmes are dying or are negatively impacted at such severe rates to yes. compared to their white counterparts. Yes. Right. Okay. And so I, I, you know, we're, we can always we can keep talking about music in the fun because it's always fun. But I, I would be remiss if we didn't make sure to really cover this mm-hmm. so that people understand this isn't just like Dr. Lenny's was like, you know what? This is going to be a really cool thing to just like think about. Right. I just want to think about liberation and personhood mm-hmm. there. The need for it exists because actual human lives, black women and femmes lives are truly at stake at devastating numbers yes. and they don't have to be. I'm really deeply in pursuit of where I can find it not showing evidence. Like I think okay. of myself as a positive psychologist who's looking for predicting like not the absence of pathology, but like the actual presence of wellness. Okay. That include those wellness measures, but it is very hard to get wellness. It just yeah. is hard to get it. And so I think about mental health. I think about physical health, not only in what your story is currently, but like, how do you, do you have intentions to go to the dentist? Do you even have intentions to go to the doctor? Right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. not just did you go, but like, if you could go, would you go? And what would yeah. you go for? Like, or, how do you think about that? Or how do you participate in health systems um, in, in addition to like mental health categories and then like personal health categories? I think mm-hmm. about relationships, like how, how many, who's your squad and like how much joy do they bring you? I think about all of this, subje- like these subjective measures of well being and wellness mm. inside and outside of the pillars of these institutions. What's your fiscal like health? Like, what, what does that look like for you? Like, I don't necessarily study physical health in terms of BMI, I do have those measures, but I say like, where are you at? Not just on the silhouette and where do you want to be? And I study that like discrepancy as the metric, not where you are, but how different from where you're trying to be are you to be able to see if that's a predictor of something. And I just think like gendered racial microaggressions and gendered racial experiences of discrimination are so pervasive. That even when you have these other cognitive, social, and emotional collective functions in place, you only have structural functions, people who have PhDs, people who have money. I like try to do an expansive like group because we have so many like women from the clinic were recruited, right? And and that everything gets better imagining, everything gets better if you have like some social stability if you but actually metrics of weathering or rear, there's um uh, Eileen Geronimus, like this um, public health scholar from the University of Michigan, has the came for this. It's a black woman story first. Let me say that black women told her in the studies about what's happening. She titled it, but let me just you know, and she's white. And shout out to her because it has been a useful analytic for how we do science on blackness. But I'm not saying she created them. I'm saying black women's lives are the grounded theory by which weathering comes into play. And through that, we understand that it is actually women who elevate in social status, who experience the most like illness, right? In that social mobility ends up taking on its own form. So we think about houses, how they like weather, extreme weather conditions, fires, rain, water, like will dull the paint, will pull the shutters off. Well, you need to fix your roof, like how your house or your tires get weathered. Black women's internal systems, their cardiometabolic illness, their stress, their like adrenal glands, every, their neurological health, all of those things weather far faster for Black women who climb uh, a social status than anybody in either category. Poor women who have always been poor have better sometimes neurological health and cardiometabolic health than women who have had to lose the bottom, if you will, mm-hmm. through any of these channels. So it isn't money. It isn't systems. It isn't security. It isn't owning homes. Gendered racism is so insipid in our fabric of American society that it couches itself everywhere. And you need a million constellations of wellness to get to chip away at the possibility of you ending up in these like health discrepancies, right? Or these like exacerbated uh, adverse health conditions that black women are constantly reporting. So, I mean, it's not, it seems dismal. It feels dismal, like, also to be like, 
let's do this, let's do this, let's like think about all these other kinds of things that could go well. What if your religious and spiritual health is right? What if your mental health is right? What if your squad is good? What if you have excellent relationships with your parents? What if you don't watch media at all? What if you read only books and know everything and you better than everybody? Are you well? And I think so often it can look well, like your your mental health, your subjective well-being might look, you know, all kinds of things. But then when you put it in a model with like in comparison to these other folks or in comparison to like white folks, you do not look well. Like it is not it, because racism and gendered racism it is when you put that in there, it accounts for so much of what happens in mental health, in physical health, in sexual health. You've got my brain spinning because I get to these points sometimes where I'm like, man, I've been doing this work forever and I have all this hope and, you know, I just want people to be liberated. And and then there's, I, you know, you hear those, these really sobering facts, this sobering reality that that anyone who's in activism or social justice work or who's even paying attention and cares to listen to those closest to the pain knows like we know it right but i can't help but have this moment of like so then what right because i i like to think that like there's always a way there's always a possibility maybe not in our time maybe not in, you know then our next generation but if we continue to pick up the baton from those that came before us and hand it off to the next generation that there's a way to affect change and so for, you know, this specifically, when we're talking about weathering, we're talking about just the overall health and well-being of black women and femmes, especially at the intersection of, well, let's just call it the fuckery that is yeah. white oppressive society mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which specifically white feminism and white women are real committed to maintaining the one notch of superiority that they think they have, right? They're like, <laughs> Yeah, feminism, but not for black people, because then who am I going to be better than? Right. Like I think about all those realities. So then the question is, so what can we do? What what does pushing the needle forward for black women and femmes towards a healthier model of wellness, towards an equitable version of wellness? What does that look like? Well, the great thing about the diaspora of Black femininity is like, we, what we do is resist and we love to apply doing it. Like, we have never, ever acquiesced to the conditions of our oppression, ever. It was never going to be that. There might have been a couple, I don't trust females in the system of chattel slavery, or I'm sure there was an Omarosa and a Stacey Dash along the way, but for the most part, girl... <laughs> That's not what these sister circles were. Like it right. never, ever, ever was that and it ain't ever going to be that. Mm -hmm. What it has always been and what it will always be is us doing the two-step in the electric slide in these long Georgia lines because we are voting anyway and we're about to flip your state. Yes. It is us getting arrested and twerking on dudes talking about you about to lose your job. <laughs> right. That is us. Yeah. And I think radical rest and joy mm -hmm is always what we have done and what we always will do. And we are always freer. Yeah. We are, and, and, and you know, the thing about how mad whiteness is, about our joy, so salty. about us laughing, about us being cute in these restaurants together, about us winning, about us headlining a Super Bowl, like how dare you? Mm -hmm. That is like evidence of the power how it how free we will always be mm -hmm. choosing our like erotic power and joy and pleasure mm -hmm. to say like i don't even speak this language and this is a vestige of colonism colonialization this religion mm -hmm. but like i'm gonna make this church service pop mm -hmm. i'm gonna make this like dogma of my oppression look like the best concert that has ever, ever been, been. In <laughs> That music still hits harder than anything. It will make a non-believer break down and cry. It is just so powerful yes. that you yeah. have amigos and everybody else who's raggedy as fuck still being like, glory to God, because that is the shit that hits me hardest, right? Yeah. This is not even about me, but it's about us and what we do yeah. that has been so amazingly... I don't celebrate resilience because I don't think anybody should have to like 
be resilient to a yeah. system who are like so invested in their death, their exploitation or death, right? Yeah mining them like africa mining them for lands like so we sat to the death blackness and also you will never get to the bottom of that well because it is literally magic yeah it is the culprit of humanity and we are the first fucking people yeah. and we have never fucking died even though you tried to poison and steal and kill and rape and pillage you mm -hmm. fail all the time mm -hmm. Look at Brad, like look at all of the Brads and the all of the Chads, like they are, they, mental health as an enterprise exists because white masculinity is so fragile that they are dying of the opioid crisis. They are the most suicidal enterprise. They are constantly out here fighting for gun laws, but they are the ones most likely to die from gun violence of themselves, right? Like they're killing their own selves. Jonathan Mitchell wrote a book called Dying of Whiteness about that opioid crisis and how it is specifically affecting white men and why white men are so invested in, like, all of a sudden um, being more expansive around drug laws mm -hmm. because they're the ones dying now. But I think we just continue to choose freedom. Yep. That's what we always have done. So you won't be the first. And again, that like going back to that question about like what is freedom to you, and it's like, oh, it's not an arrival. Yeah. It's the practice of continuing every day to choose us. Yep. To choose more, even if it doesn't seem like that's the story, knowing that we deserve more and knowing that it is our like intergenerational legacy mm -hmm. to choose freedom or face death. Because what we will never do is decide that we are worth the crap that you have tried to articulate us. Yes, I love it. I think this this is that's like the, this is like the perfect full circle callback to like the beginning of our conversation, right? Like people don't think that they have choice, but you can always choose your own liberation. You can always choose your own freedom. You can always choose joy. You can always choose rest. And I truly think that the more of us that begin to do it, the more we can model that in our own squads, in our own communities, and it becomes a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of I have a lot of listeners of all social identities, but specifically to white folks my because they'll always ask well like, so what can we do to make it better mind your business also get your cousins get i was just friends. gonna say gather your people and like and get, mind your business go do that go yep. do that I, shout out to like the real ones in like i think people can say all kinds of things about what like white anti-racism looks like and how effective it might be but i have not met and have been in community with like actually like remarkable game-changing folks who have taken that to an echelon who are doing all the work to figure out what is the minefield called like how did we get here thinking that we are worth a goddamn like how because i'm looking at all the receipts and the facts and it just suggests you're the math ain't mathin and still we are walking around locking doors looking at people who the evidence would suggest have never done anything actually to our well literally, literally. <laughs> So I just think everybody just making choices yeah. every day in the better. I'm not saying that some people are working 18 jobs and you have to, but I think there's a lot of analytics and there's a lot of folks who have written and who live a life about what does wellness look like in all of these social conditions. And I think making the choice to read or think about what does it mean to make a decision, you're still doing. I'm still working. I still work on a plantation. I do. But yeah. I'm literally glowing fully and beautifully in Oakland and, and reveling in the opportunity, knowing it may not come again, but taking this as nothing but um, a, a breeding ground, if you will, to seed freedom, seed sovereignty yes. in the moment. So I go back wherever I go, far more restored than I would have ever been. They're yes. just making a bunch of choices to be full yeah. and thinking about however we can do that and being committed to that. And that looks like religion for some people. That looks like fasting for others that mm -hmm. looks like fucking for mm -hmm. men um but whatever it is pleasure activism just like calls like what does it mean to be vigilant yeah about fullness about pleasure about feeling full and then make a practice wherever you are big and small to doing that yeah so good so so good thank you for being here before we wrap is there like any one last thing that you're like i have to say this before we go. 
I mean, you've left us with so many gems, mm -hmm. but want to give you the space just in case. Well, what I have to say is I'm having this conversation in an echo chamber because I'm an academic and I spend a lot of time writing grants and writing papers, but it's not for them. Yeah. None of this work is for them. They have it. They're the primary beneficiaries and they don't even know how to read it. Yeah. So I am interested constantly in asking questions that are for you and being in community with you and thinking about diversifying what is dissemination in ways that actually meet, justify the ends, which is like bringing it back to my folks. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come and speak with you and be in conversation with you about what I'm thinking about and what my team has been like engineering in our lab to like, but I want to be in conversation with you, all the listeners. I want to have a conversation about what, what does fullness look like for you? What does freedom look like for you? What does pleasure look like for you? What's in the way? So like, please reach out um, and invite me to have a conversation with you, have a conversation with your team, like in getting this conversation the most out of the grasp of the hands who are the least committed to our wellness yeah. is my primary goal. So if any of you or your listeners know of different kinds of ways that I might be able to do that. Oh, I've already got like 15 ideas in my head right now. Yes, I'm ready. So, I'm ready. You're be like, why does she keep DMing me? <laughs> <laughs> Please do. All right, y'all. You know where to find all the contacts and the links. We do it in the show notes um, or on the website. Dr. Avery, I feel like I got to say it at least one time in its proper form. <laughs> I don't know why. That's like my like very fancy voice. <laughs> I love it. Give it to me. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Avery. Thank you so much for being here. Again, it is never lost on me that people can spend their time in a lot of ways. So I'm always honored when they choose to spend it with me. Um, Y'all, be kind to yourselves. Be kind to each other. Read all the things that Dr. Avery has spent so much time putting out there. And then exactly the the ask that was made if you know anyone that is having these conversations that's committed to wellness and fullness and and you know personhood and all versions of liberation mental emotional physical sexual specifically for black women and femmes but for folks of color specifically women of color y'all y'all go holler Definitely. all right y'all that's all i got bye <laughs> all right y'all that's all i got but don't forget your action items one Join me on Podia where you can get access to tons of BTS content, including a very special Weez and Air interview with all of our guests. To rate, review, especially a written review, subscribe, like, and share this podcast with all of your peoples. Three, if you aren't already, go peep me on IG, follow me there, and, you know, most importantly, keep coming back. All right, until next time, toodles! Toodles!